Hey, good evening, Liberty Meers and others interested in the topic of anarchism. It's good to see you tonight. Just to adjust my tabs. Hello, 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 guest Pat. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope I hope my sound sounds good. I can see the chat window, which is very, very nice. So, which means I think that you'll be able to ask questions and I'll be able to answer them um, as the seminar goes along. So I would encourage you to ask any questions, you know, interrupt me anytime. Um, I don't want to call it seminar. I would say there should be other, some other word for this. I mean, seminar sounds dreadful. It's like, oh, some guy talking to you. Like, we haven't had that enough in life, right? I mean, from the very earliest age, we've been lectured to. So tedious. From the kindergarten all the way through graduate school, there's some guy in front of you um, yapping and telling you what to think. So I, I can't stand this idea of a seminar. Um, lecture doesn't sound right either. Discussion is good. Uh, but um, but it's actually kind of difficult to discuss in this context. And mostly, too, I, uh, I talk too much. So... <laughs> so. I don't know. We need some of the, yeah, maybe hangout is is actually the right the right word, right? I kind of like the idea of a, of a hangout. Um, I always enjoy Sunday evenings uh, going through the literature. You know, at the outset of this series, I picked twenty five books that I really love, and so it's kind of exciting for me. Um, this is actually my second time through the twenty five books. Um, I forget now what number one. But I never mind it because the book is kind of a it serves as a nice launching pad for a discussion of the topic, and increasingly that's what I'm doing. You know, not just ad adhering to the text, but using the text as a as a basis for discussing some other big issue. And um, last week we talked about, I think John T. Uh, John T. Flynn's book called called um, As We Go Marching and. And brown shirt fascism as a as a as an ideology, you know, and and how that's how it's different, I believe, from kind of left wing socialism. Even though they're both varieties of socialism, they're distinct varieties. I I I, I sincerely believe this that there is such a thing as right wing socialism and there's left wing socialism. They're distinct uh, for particular reasons. And I think that this is an important claim because. Uh, you know, historians and historiographers and philosophers dispute this all the time, but um, I'm very much convinced of it. And I also argued last week that I thought right-wing uh, socialism was a much greater, right-wing fascism, I guess you could say, uh, is a much greater danger to American liberty and always has been than the sort of mythical idea of, 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 of uh, socialism and, and the Red Scare, which was never a legitimate threat to the United States at all. So, in terms of American liberty, or even liberty in the West generally, I mean, the Bolshevik Revolution spooked everybody. Um, but yeah, I, was, I argued that for like a hundred years we've been um, we've been afraid of a myth, essentially. We, even as the brown shirts have been gathering around us in, in every form, and the brown shirts don't have to be necessarily right wing. <laughs> There's left wing brown shirts, left wing right wing brown shirts, you know, um, which I would sort of consider. Uh, Obamacare to be a great example of that. <laughs> anyway, I talked about a lot of this last week and, and tried to take you back to World War II and the Times and John T. Flynn as a thinker and a writer and, and, and where he went with all this stuff. Now this week, I get to talk about, it was one of the few brand new books that I have in the collection um, called Conscience of an Anarchist by Gary Chartier, uh, Chartier, Chartier or Chartier, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, historian of, of business philosopher, uh, ethicist in Southern California, I forget now which university he teaches at. But um, I, I had the opportunity to publish this book, actually. As I look back at it, um, I was at the Mises Institute at the time, and he wrote the book and sent it to me. And... I was trying to get it through the editorial process, and I became a little bit severe with it, um, and uh, a little bit cautious about the text and and critical at certain points. Uh, just just because I was I was assigned to doing a distinct sort of edit, I had a distinct editorial role, um, and I you know eventually bumped into uh, barriers that I could not overcome, and I wasn't able to publish it actually. Um, 
Uh, one of the things I asked for was a, a change in the name. I have to say that was my own judgment that the name should, of the book should not be conscious of an anarchist, it should be something else. Uh, looking back, I was definitely wrong about that. Um, it's, 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 it's actually uh, fairly interesting how this happens. Um, uh, one quick second. Um, it, it's one of my few times in my life um, one, hold on just one second. I'm letting somebody know about where this seminar is. Okay. Um, it's one of the few times in my life when I actually had the opportunity to publish uh, what I think might eventually emerge as a, as a kind of a seminal work. You know, the kind of book that maybe people will be reading in 20 years, you know, uh, 30 years, 50 years. Yeah, something like a, a modern classic, I, and uh, and and declined it. You know, which is is kind of something of a disgrace to me, actually, because you know you hear stories all the time, like, uh, oh, you know, seventy publishers rejected Little House in, in the Book of Woods when it was first submitted, or you know, whatever whatever the thing, whatever the apocryphal story is about. You know, oh, George Orwell submitted, you know, nineteen eighty four to you know, 140 publishers before one picked that up, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, neither, I mean, I'm just making this up, but, you know, you hear stories like this and your first thought is, is uh, wow, the pub publishers are really incredibly stupid. Well, you know, so I'm just going to admit to you that I was one of those people that actually re rejected a, a classic. <laughs> so that itself is sort of part of the story. I mean, I, I held on to it for months. I was trying to solicit really good reviews of the book and I got some and uh, but I, I just eventually I ran into uh, 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 one one simple barrier you know and and so I had to I had to turn it down he was actually extremely gracious about it then it ended up being published by a very small and I think nearly defunct uh, publisher in California uh, a publishing, a small publishing house run by Jim Perrin. And fortunately, uh, Gary, with, with extraordinary foresight, um, insisted that the book be published, you know, in the commons, meaning that the publisher did not have exclusive rights to it. Um, if you're in a position to publish a book, I mean, please consider this option because if it weren't for for the author having insisted upon putting this in the commons, this book would have absolutely died the death. You would not be reading it now. And um, nobody would have been able to read this book for another uh, essentially 170 years. And when I say that, I'm not actually exaggerating. You know, the way copyright works, the author believes that he retains copyright, but what you're actually doing is you're assigning the publication rights to a single publisher. Um, in the old days, before 1962, that lasted 28 years, and then you could renew it, you know, under a new law that was passed in, you know, the 30s or the 40s or something like that for an additional, like, 56. But eventually the law in 1962, 1963 was changed. Actually, it was changed retroactively. It was like 1967 and going backwards uh, to be compatible with European law so that now um, uh, copyright agreements are binding for uh, 70 years, uh, um, I, I'm sorry, no, for the lifetime of the author, for the lifetime of the author. So uh, during the whole of your life, you don't ever have access to your own works anymore. Um, in the old days before digital media, what would happen is that, that, that publishers would get, get, grow tired of, of putting out um, of, of keeping a book in print, so the book would fall out of print, and the law said, not so much the law, but court precedent said, if that should happen, then the rights revert to the author. And that was fine, because many books went out of print, but guess what happens um, in an age of, of uh, print on demand, right? I mean, um, there's no such thing as the book going out of print, so long as the publisher survives. And everybody can survive if nothing else is a letterhead organization and keep a book in print, essentially forever. So if you, if you give away 
well, I should say it more precisely, because uh, th this can still afflict you even if you retain copyright. If you de if you fail to get your book published into the Commons under some very liberal license, uh, my preference is for a Creative Commons attribution. You will see your book you know, essentially robbed from you, from your person, from your from your own possession, uh, for your entire life. Plus, and this is where it gets it gets remarkable, uh, seventy years. So, so that that it's it's possible that that the only people who would be in a position to have access to your work ever again will be something like your great grandchildren, who probably don't care anything about your work. So this is a disaster. This is a death sentence for, for books. It, it really is. Well, anyway, uh, Gary, with great foresight, saw that he should publish it in the Commons. So about six months after the book came out, and when it wasn't really moving, because, I mean, God bless the publisher, they did not have distribution channels, they didn't have access to, to uh, marketing efforts, I was able to pick up the book and republish it at Leslie Fair Books. So I put it out there, and that was, that was exciting, but even there, it didn't quite take off like it should have, because uh, this was an audience that was mostly interested in finance and economics, and this sort of high high uh, philosophy books uh, just didn't didn't have a market there either. But yeah, I was able to 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 to, to, to get it out there at least behind a paywall. Um, and and then and then when I um, when I started Liberty Me, I was able to uh, because again it was in the Commons, move the text over to Liberty Me and, and give it to you. And and now I see that it actually the book has had a widespread influence. And you see it at conferences all the time. There's many different editions with many different uh, uh, um, covers and that sort of thing. Now you might say, well, that doesn't really work because a publisher, the author can never really make money under those circumstances. Well, you know, I, I think I might even grant that point, actually. <laughs> It's for, I mean, it's it's possible for an author to make money even with the, the book in, in the Commons. I, I don't think those are incompatible. But the truth of the matter is, and I hate to put it this way, but it's just a hardcore reality. Um, it is extremely unlikely that you will ever make a dime from writing a book. It's just true. Yeah, there are people who have and people who do, obviously. Uh, there are New York Times best-selling authors who make a lot of money. Uh, Ayn Rand made a lot of money, you know. Um, there are people who make money writing books. Uh, politicians, George Bush writes a book, yeah, he's going to make money. Um, but for the average, for you and me, uh, for the average academic, especially for, a, for a, a kind of a philosophical treatise like this, there's very little chance of making money anyway. So it doesn't really matter whether you put it in the comments or not. On the other hand, he got his ideas out there. And he became a very important thinker and had what he wanted, which was to have the largest possible influence. So, so why is this book so important? Um, I guess that's what I would like to address. I mean, he it, it, it says it very bluntly at the, in the top word, conscience of an anarchist. Um, well, what about this term, anarchist? Is it, is it too radical? Is it, is it regrettable? Is it, is it a term that we should, we should avoid? Is it... Uh, you know, cause people to dismiss us. You know, uh, for my part, I guess it goes without saying that if a term is going to be misunderstood, it's always a good idea to use another term. I mean, I have no particular investment in anything I call myself. I don't, if people think libertarians are wackos, I'm not going to call myself a libertarian, you know. Um, if, if people think anarch anarchists, all anarchists are, are, are dangerous bomb, bomb throwers who are just, uh, you know, obviously crazy, then, yeah, I'm going to avoid that term. But in general, I find that the term anarchism, anarchist, anarchism is, is, is good because it, it, it convinces your, the person you're talking to that at the very least you have an independent mind. Uh, you might have something interesting, something good to say. And I can't personally remember any occasion in which I've, told a crowd of people that I'm an anarchist where I experienced anything like negative uh,
bounce back from that. I mean, just two nights ago, I was speaking at Bitcoin at Atlanta, which is which is a group in Atlanta where I live, and there's about 440 members. Most of them are technicians, and uh, uh, you know, in the I IT industry of one sort or another, uh, information systems, um, engineers, software engineers, uh, that sort of thing. They're they're not. This is not necessarily a political group at all. I mean, maybe you. Lots of people think Bitcoiners are all are all crazy libertarians. It's, ac it's actually not true. A, a, a tiny minority of them are actually, for the most part, they're just people impressed with with uh, impressive technology. So, you know, I was a little bit conscious as I was speaking, and the subject of politics came up and regulation, that sort of thing. And I said outright, I said, "Look, I'm like a, I'm an anarchist. I don't believe in any kind of regulation at all." And then I went on to discuss it, and I, I could tell actually within the room. Uh, rather than than experiencing something like um, uh, pushback from that, I saw people sort of uh, cock their heads a little bit and be and smile and be curious about it. You know, so I don't um, I don't shy away from the term. Also, for me, um, to the extent you believe that 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 word should be, you know, as accurate as possible, it is actually the best description of me. Um, as a as, and my own personal outlook on the world, anarchism is pretty much. I, th I think about this all the time. Like, what are you sure of in politics? You know, what can you be absolutely sure would be a good thing for the world? Um, and there's not a whole lot we can be absolutely sure about. There's a lot of things about laws and regulations and terms of humans and engagements and technologies and um, religions and you know, you name it. That. That, that are always always shifting, that we're always searching for, uh, always discovering new things. But the, the one thing I feel absolutely certain about, I mean, that, that sort of implacable sense of an unchangeable uh, position that serves as sort of the core way that I see the world, something I, I'm, I can't imagine, I cannot imagine any conditions under which I would stop being an anarchist um that that's that's what anarchism represents to me it represents the the sort of the ideological rock of gibraltar you know the the one thing i can really be absolutely certain about everything else about the world is always in flux um you know and i i think i speak for most of us and say our our views towards uh, towards virtually everything is in flux and and that's a beautiful thing whether it's you know, uh, metaphysics, you know, uh, God or uh, epistemology or the relationship between between faith and, 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 and reason. Obviously, scientific questions have to always be um, in flux. Almost everything else I can think of in the world, in my own mind, is, is always uh, moving and evolving. And sometimes I've actually had changes of opinions on things. Um, but the subject of, but, but anarchism, uh, no, that that's one thing I'm almost certain about. And what do I mean when I say that? What I mean is it's pretty simple, and it's the same thing Chartier means in his own book, which is that the state as an institution makes no positive contribution to causing the world to be at a better place, uh, uh, to be a, uh, to be a better place in a way in which it would be impossible to accomplish that same task through uh, non-state means. That's essentially what I mean by anarchism. That's it. That's the whole story. I just don't believe the state does anything good for the world that the world itself cannot accomplish in absence of the state. And beyond that, of course, there's a great conviction that the state is uh, responsible for vast amounts of human evil uh, in fact, uh, there's not a lot we can do about natural disasters. There's not a lot we can do about a lot of things in the world, but there is something we can do, which is what makes this whole subject so frustrating about the state. We can get rid of it. It's within our power. We, as human beings, constructed the state, and it uh, never makes a positive contribution, and it's always destructive. That's, that's what anarchism comes down to. And his book lays it out in a very beautiful way. Um, he consciously set out to not make this uh, 
a partisan book. Maybe that strikes you as strange. Like, how do you write a treatise on anarchism without being partisan? You know, <laughs> it sounds like the ultimate partisanship to be an anarchist, right? But in fact, there are many varieties of anarchism in the world. And he did not want to choose among them, uh, which I very much appreciate. Um, in fact, I learned so much from the book in that sense. His, his, his type of anarchism, you know, in, in terms of its heritage, grows out of a classical liberal position, a, a conviction that, and I always like to define classical liberalism as uh, the conviction that the world um, works on its own, that society can manage itself in absence of um, a coercive top-down authority. Uh, that's what that's a great liberal uh, discovery that 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 human the, that human beings are self-ordering uh, that the social order is something that is organically created one step at a time out of individual human decision making um, and that all the beautiful things we see around us were not created by a single mind at the top but rather have emerged out of the gradual trial and error of the struggle of human life to, uh, in an evolutionary sense, crawl out of the state of nature into something remotely resembling civilization. Um, and and, and, and uh, that's, that's liberalism. That was the great discovery of, of the Scottish Enlightenment. I mean, this was never understood in the ancient world, uh, whereas always assumed that, you know, without Caesar, the world would fall apart. You know, everything beautiful in the world, you know, could be traced to the Pharaoh, uh, to whoever was in charge. Uh, it was, it was, it was in a, in a, in a, non liberal doctrines are, are trying to discern an explanation for why the world looks the way it does. Um, liberalism came up with a radical solution that the world looks the way it does, uh, not because anybody planned it to be that way, but because it, it gradually emerged that way out of the cooperative actions of, of individuals. So you can tell the difference between a liberal, a genuine liberal, and a, an authoritarian by, you know, the reactions of driving into a great city, you know, Atlanta, um, Milwaukee, Chicago, um, New York, for that matter. And a non liberal will drive in and say, wow, whoever was behind this city must have been a genius. You know, uh, the genuine liberal will be uh, impressed rather at the unplanned nature of the order that you see. That there's no uh, creator, that there's only uh, 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 millions and millions of tiny creators, uh, none of whom see the whole picture, all of whom are acting in their self-interest, but through the institutions of the social order are led to cooperate in ways that, uh, that, that, that create results that are larger than the sum of their parts. That was the great discovery of liberalism. So Chartier-style anarchism is essentially an outgrowth of that because in the early days of liberalism, um, uh, you know, all the early liberals believed that you should have less of a state, uh, not too much of a state. It should do less and less, that it should only, I don't know, uh, do the, have the following six functions. You know, everybody disagrees on what those functions are. Um, but as, as liberalism evolved over time, uh, the, the, the role of the state became less and less. And then finally, uh, under the pure anarchist position, vanishes, you know, completely. Um, I would say probably the Chartier style, style anarchism, the, the first great, you know, anarchist in the Chartier uh, tradition uh, was the, the great 19th century uh, thinker. I, I wonder if anybody in the chat room could guess who it is. Who was it that was associated with Bastiat among the, I've got the chat window on out right now. Among the among the the, the French liberals, in in the in the eighteen say eighteen forties, who first who first 
observed that the state was was not necessary, you know, at at all, and served no function whatsoever. Can anybody uh, put the name in the in the chat window? It's not like a pop quiz or whatever. Oh, wait, just a second. Okay, I'm not seeing the name pop up. Um, nope, nobody's guessing. Okay, his name is Gustav de Molinari, a colleague of, of, of Friedrich Bastiat and one of the leading thinkers of the of 19th century French liberalism. And when he, uh, not, not Spooner, no, it was uh, uh, Gustav de Molinari. He wrote the, the 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 first great essay called um, "Market for Security." Not Bautier. but Bautier was a, was a total revolutionary, but but not actually an anarchist. He was in favor of over, overthrowing the government, not not getting rid of it forever. <laughs> yeah. So Gustav de Molinari. I'm realizing that there's a time delay here, so I, I should have waited even longer. Uh, but anyway. And when he came out with his, his argument, all, all he simply said was, you know, we, we accept that the market uh, controls the, is, is beautiful for managing the distributions of all kinds of goods and services that we used to think had to be kind of planned by, by the prince. Now we realize that it's better left to the social order and to the forces of laissez-faire, laissez-passer, right? Um, but he said, we tend to make this exception for security but there's really no basis for this whatsoever. If the market's good, if, if it is the suitable means for providing for you know, our, our food, our, our crops, our, our housing, uh, for, for trade and for all kinds of services that we use from, and from finance to insurance to everything else, um, and that, that even religion itself, which is, you know, everybody agrees is extremely important, should nonetheless be left to the market, um, why did we make an exception for security? And he says, quite simply, there's no basis for this whatsoever. And went on to argue that the market uh, could, pro is, could provide for security better than any single alternative. Then what was very interesting to me about that debate, and I didn't entirely understand this until recently, there was a gigantic reaction um, against Molinari. For holding this view, I mean, it, it challenged people fundamentally. Essentially, what he said was, "Look, uh, in some ways, leaving security to, to a monopoly of the state is the most dangerous thing you could really ever do because you make the state the night watchman, uh, then you give a monopoly to the state over uh, over something you know something as important as security, and you're guaranteeing uh, it will it'll lead to uh, abuse." Wars, violence, and all kinds of slaveries, and that so long as you have a state at all, it's going to grow and be completely out of control. Um, and in some sense, the worst thing you could leave the state in charge of is is in securing our, our property. That's something that should be left to us, and to not to the state. The state is always and everywhere a violator of of property rights, not a keeper of them. <laughs> so, um, but there was a huge reaction, and I'm 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 a little bit surprised by this because I'm. I'm sure when you read Friedrich Bastiat and the other liberals of the time, um, you, at least I do, I have a sense of their great seeming sympathy for a stateless society, you know? Like, like you know Bastiat's rule that he has, in which he says that the state should never be, the law should never be, do to us what we're not allowed to do to each other. So I think if you apply that 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 uh, that position consistently, what you end up with essentially is the anarchist position. Right? Uh, this seems very obvious to me. It apparently, was not obvious to Bastiat, who reacted with rage actually at the at the Molinari thesis. Um, somehow, people are reluctant to finally you know let go of that last bit of attachment that they have to the state and, and imagining. That 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 they will design a, a, the right kind of state, and that the state will be the kind of state that they want it to be, and that the state will not abuse its power, and it'll do a better job than the rest of the social order in in, in achieving this great goal. 
Uh, you know, it's it seems it's even saying it like that. It strikes me as such a ridiculous illusion. Um, uh, you know, so roughly along the lines of believing that the state can centrally plan the economy, to imagine that you could have a government that only does what you want it to do, but not what you want, but not what you don't want it to do, is a, an absurd intellectual conceit, really. But Molinar got rid of it, and. Um, it's very beautiful. Some people call him the the first anarcho-capitalist. So let me let me discuss varieties of of anarchism that are out there that are extant out there, and and talk about each one in turn, uh, and contrast them with what what I'm calling the um, Chartier form of anarchism, which I would rename mere anarchism. I, I like that term. It's it's a it's a play on C.S. Lewis's book uh, Mere Christianity. Who was sick of all the sectarianism in the world and thought he would just write a book that really sort of boiled down the essence of Christianity and present it, you know, for the ages, which, which he did. He did a good job of it. So, um, and, and in a similar vein, I would, I would call uh, Chartier's Conscience of an Anarchism a, a sort of canonical statement of mere anarchism. And after I go through some of the other varieties of anarchism, I'll talk to you about what I think are the distinctive marks of mere anarchism. Okay, so um, in the first uh, first type, uh, um, I think I'll just mention what we could call anarcho-utopianism, um, which I I'm mean, not even sure that it deserves the, the term anarchism or utopianism at all. Uh, you can trace this view back to various religious mystics of, of uh, the Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages. We only know about um, these particular sects and wackos because of the age of writing. You know, never forget this. You know, some, sometimes our historiography is heavily biased uh, by the fact that people could, could only begin to write down thoughts and write down histories in a and in an efficient, verifiable, uh, somewhat accurate way, unless you're a big shot, you know, in the ancient world, or you know, a, a, a well-paid bishop with with tons of acolytes in, in the early Christian age. For the most part, um, people could only write down stuff as they were happening, you know, in, in, in true histories, unless you know, like, like I say, unless you were sort of a court historian or something. And the High Middle Ages. So a lot of what we think began in the High Middle Ages probably began much earlier. It's just we just have our first records of it. So, so we have a lot of uh, contemporary histories of of, of, of insane utopian experiments. Uh, you know, Joachim of Fiora in Germany, and and uh, or I'm sorry, and Joachim of Fiora in France, and then um, the Münster cult in Germany, and some of these some of these other wackos who just imagined that. The, the answer to, to all things was to destroy uh, custom and social order, uh, emergent norms, uh, to essentially smash everything in sight um, that was materially oriented as a way of ascending to another realm, and living in the transcendent and, beca transcendent and becoming people of the spirit rather than people of, of the flesh. You know, it was a, sort of an outgrowth of the old Manichaean heresy of the, of the fourth century. You know, the material world was always corrupt. It's the darkness, and so we always have to, you know, strive to to live with the spirit and the in the in the state of light, and deny the flesh as much as possible. The sort of anarcho utopianism is a brand of that. You might say that that current day environmentalism is a, a sort of form of that. Um, it's called anarchism because of its attachment to because of its loathing of social institutions. That is definitely not the kind of anarchism I'm talking about here. The kind of anarchism. Um, I'm speaking of is really particularly directed against the state as an institution. Uh, I've not defined uh, the state as an institution. I'm not sure that I need to in this crowd. Um, I'm going to add one more here as I'm talking. Um, okay, closely related to this is anarcho, what I would call anarcho perfectionism. People who imagine that if we get rid of the state, that human beings would become perfect and not violence would no longer be necessary for the management of the social order. Anytime you, um, you read Ludwig von Mises, for example, and he's attacking anarchism, this is what he's attacking. This idea of the, perf the, the perfectibility of man 
and the possibility of eliminating violence uh, from the world or the threat of violence from the world. That is not what I'm talking about. Now, in particular, what I mean to say is that like, um, you know, for, force is of course an undeniable fact of the world. You, you have to have it. I have to be able to, uh, if, uh, if somebody breaks down my, my front door and, 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 and starts to attack me, I have to be in the position of fighting back and using um, retaliatory violence. Uh, to, pre to, to prevent that from happening, the, th the constant threat of retaliatory violence, in a sense, you could say, is, is absolutely essential to, to keeping the world peaceful and, and orderly. And the, the complete elimination of even the threat of violence for the world um, would probably not lead to peace, it would probably lead to um, something uh, truly ghastly. You know, um, modern gun controllers are a little bit this way. If we just get, you know, we just imagine if we get rid of guns, we'll get rid of violence. I mean, that's that's absurd. So when Mises is attacking anarchism, that's what he's attacking. Uh, there's a hint of this in so-called Christian anarchism of of Tolstoy, nineteenth-century Russian thinkers. Um, I think Mises, in some sense, caricatured them, but um, but nonetheless. This, this, these people who imagine that if we get rid of the w weaponry and um, locks and the things that protect us, you know, th things that, that, that hint slightly of the possibility of using coercion, that human, hum humanity would, you know, the lions would lie down with the lambs, everything would just be perfect, uh, there'd be no more trouble in the world, anarcho -perf perfectionism. That is not the kind of anarchism I'm talking about. And that's. Mises never got that out of his head. I mean, poor Mises. As he got older, of course, the anarcho-capitalists, you know, invaded his space in a way, and uh, he was extremely annoyed at him. Um, and he could never get out of his head that they they had fallen for the old uh, perfectionist fallacies, you know, of the nineteenth nineteenth century. He was never able to sort of update his his, his sense of things. Okay, so there's um, also anarcho-socialism. All right, let me start with anarcho-communism, really. Um, Marx was an anarcho-communist, as we all know. He imagined the gradual withering away of the state uh, and his highest uh, achievement of, of his ideals. But in the meantime, you know, it, you know he, he imagined that the state was sustained by the institution of uh, private property and the ruling class that was the main private uh, holders of, 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 main owners of capital. So we had to... Had some, had some, the the community, the workers and the peasants, uh, the late, late with the working classes, had to have some, some tools to disgorge the, the 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 capital owning ruling class of their property and therefore their power and therefore uh, uh, get rid of uh, the state as it's always been known. And in the intervening period, there would have to be a dictatorship of the proletariat before the state uh, withered away. Uh, eventually, and of course, what's what's funny about these people? In, in other words, the anarcho-communist vision: the enemy is not the state as such. The state is only it's it's a kind of inevitable tool that is used by the capital-owning ruling classes to exploit the population. So the problem as such isn't isn't the state. It's 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 the existence of, of private capital. So if you have to have a period in which there's a, a dictatorship to the proletariat, a, a state-like thing, that is not an ex, uh, a, a, that is not used as a tool of, of the capital and the ruling classes, that's just something you have to put up with. That's a necessary stage to bringing about the final stages of socialism. And of course, that's exactly what has happened in the 20th century. Every time uh, socialism was implemented. What we got rid of was one state uh, with the replacement of another state. And somehow the third stage, where the state withers away completely, uh, never arrives. I found myself extremely annoyed uh, by anarcho communists um, because, you know, they call themselves anarchists, um, but their enemies, they've got the enemy wrong all the time. Uh, I mean, I think it was last year, uh, and Seattle seems to have its, you know, just you know, disproportionate number of anar anarcho-communists. And the thing that really inspires them is um, is tearing down private capital and, 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 and material wealth. So these people, 
you know, inadvertently, in a very strange way, end up being used by the existing ruling class, the real ruling class, uh, to attack uh, uh, upstart companies that are doing very well for themselves, like like Uber. There was a big protest among the, and the press always loves to call these people anarchists. Oh, the anarchists attacked Uber in Seattle. Well, they're anarcho-communists essentially, and they set out to to hate on on Uber and its and its wealth and its and its, and its property. Um, and used violence against their drivers. I mean, so what were they doing? Basically, they're supporting the taxicab monopoly. You know, that's a hell of a thing, right? Devote your life to anarcho-communism, um, but in effect, what you're doing is being used as a, a sort of a lackey for a municipal cab monopoly. I mean, that's talk about lacking ideals. <laughs> it's just kind of pathetic. <laughs> Then there are the anarcho-socialists, and um, I would say this is probably the, the dominant form of, of, of anarchism in, in, in the world today. Most of the people you run across who call themselves anarchists are essentially socialists. Um, my strong impression um, of the anarcho-socialists, it's not bad guys, really, and um, very interesting. They hate our guts, by the way. By our, I mean... Uh, private property libertarian anarchists. Uh, they think we're we're essentially tools of the ruling class ourselves, and they loathe us. But I, I think my, my sense of the anarcho socialists, the problem is that they none of them understand the first thing about economics, and that's 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 the key problem with them. And what what does it mean to understand something about economics? Well. The very first thing that economics observes is that we live in a world of scarcity, which is to say that there's not enough of everything right now to serve the full range of human wishes that are also in existence. So there's a discoordination um, between means and ends. We live in a world of limited means and unlimited ends. So therefore, which is another way of saying we have scarcity. So therefore we have to have some institutions um, that mitigate this conflict. You know, the fact that, that everybody on the planet wants a Tesla now, uh, but there are only so many Teslas in the world. What do you do about that? Well, you could um, uh, uh, create a war of all against all, or you can establish um, private property rights and a price system to allocate things. Essentially, that's it. And, and socialists seem to have never gotten this. This is a key problem with socialists from the beginning of the time. They've never really understood uh, uh, how scarcity constrains the uh, possibilities for the spread of universal wealth. And that if we're going to get ever more prosperous, we have to take it in steps. And that step, the steps have to involve institutions. Um, the, 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 the private provision of, of, of the, the privatization of all property, um, the existence of things like... Um, uh, the existence of, of things like um, uh, the opportunity to exchange, uh, capital markets on which things can be traded, and prices to provide the terms of those exchange and to give us tools and institutions and signals to allow us to run cost accounting so we can get ever better at discerning the most socially desirable way of distributing re existing resources. That's it. That's the whole thing. And the socialists, just like what I just told you, um, just seems this, it seems to bypass them entirely. And there's some very smart people in this in this in the world of anarcho socialists, but they seem to not have understood that. The first basic economic uh, lesson that I could put on an index card and distribute uh, at their rallies. Um, uh, and when you tell them things like, well, but you need private property really to establish exchange because only through exchange can you have a peaceful way to allocate um, private property resources and, and have a system of profit and loss that leads to 
and most socially desirable um, uh, prioritization of scarce resources in the world, they, they just look at you and say, well, clearly you're just an apologist for the bourgeoisie. You know, that's, that's the whole thing. Okay. Um, so, and the, and the final form of the, of the five, I mentioned anarcho-utopianism, anarcho-perfectionism, anarcho-socialism, anarcho-capitalism, uh, I'm sorry, anarcho-communism, is, of course, anarcho-capitalism, which I guess you could say uh, I'm supposed to be a, a, an apologist or a representative of that school of thought. And to some extent, I would say this is true of Chartier, but I think there's problems with that. And the problem with calling yourself an anarcho-capitalism, and I and I don't, and I no longer refer to myself um, with with this term, uh, not because I I don't believe in private property and capital. In fact, you know, capital is is in some sense uh, the most important institution for 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 creating civilization, sustaining it. Um, I said it implies that you have a model, and that you have a plan, and that you know how the social order should work, in absence of the state. Um, and I don't think we need to be giving out that idea. In other words, if you want to think of the term anarcho-capitalism as purely descriptive of what would happen in absence of the state, I have no problem with it. If, however, you see it as prescriptive, um, then, then there's a problem uh, because... Uh, uh, because we actually are not prescribing capitalism on the world. I mean, capitalism is not so much the fulfillment of anybody's plan, at least I don't like to believe that it is, although it has been in many ways historically. I don't think it necessarily should be or must be. Um, but as a purely a, a descriptive vision of, of what would happen in absence of a state, I have no problem with it, but prescriptively, no, it's a very bad idea. And this is why I don't, I don't use the term at all. Not to mention the fact that there's plenty of problems with anarcho-capitalism, actually, as an ideology. For example, uh, one of the things you notice about, about the anarcho-communists and the anarcho-socialists, they tend to be very solid, uh, sound, good thinkers on one issue in particular, namely intellectual property. Um, I don't know how much time I have to go into this. I'll just try to sum it up very, very quickly. But, you know, ide ideas as, as goods, if you can think of them as goods, actually do conform to the communist idea. There is no scarcity in the realm of ideas. We can share them infinitely. If I have one idea and the right technology to enable it, that idea can be multiplied, shared, consumed uh, trillions, infinite number of times instantaneously without the existence of institutions governing scarce resources. You don't need prices. You don't need allocations. You don't need property rights and ideas. So in that sense, they're onto something. I mean, the anarcho-socialists and the anarcho-communists, their mistake is applying what they know about the realm of ideas. And by, the, by ideas, I mean like everything, in, inventions, creativity, art, music, sermons, inspiring messages, um, movies, seeds, yeah, whatever, every, you know, technology. All these, it's not it's technology that goes into seeds, referring to the Monsanto case in particular. But all these things are actually communistically held. And in that sense, I, I'm very happy to call myself a communist in the realm of ideas. The problem with the communists is that they applied, they applied what they learned from observing the beautiful magical world of ideas to the realm of physical property. The problem with the, with the anarcho-capitalists has historically been a tendency to apply the rules that pertain to the realm of private property in the physical world to everything else also. Do you see what I mean? I mean, the, the communists wanted to apply what's true in ideas to the physical world, that was wrong. But the anarcho-capitalists have tended to apply what they see in the physical world to the realm of ideas. That is equally wrong. 
These are different realms. One is subject to the constraints of scarcity and the other is not. Um, I would mention Ayn Rand is a good example of this. I mean, she was such a, she was obviously not an anarchist, she was a capitalist, but she, she wanted to sort of like make capitalism the reigning philosophy of the whole of reality. <laughs> You know, that she was so convinced of its merits that so she thought there was absolutely no limit to its applicability. So suddenly it had to be applied in the realm of ideas in the same way it was applied, and especially in the realm of ideas, since ideas are, are unusually valuable, in the same way it applied to the physical world. And this is just a, this is just a mistake. And, and, and truly, you can look through the capitalist literature from Adam Smith all the way up to Murray Rothbard and see uh, that there is a, a, like, like a weird blindness uh, uh, among all among thousands of thinkers in the in the capitalist world towards the magic and beauty of the realm of ideas and how different it is from everything else <laughs> so um, I, I in fact you know that I can only think of one before Stefan Kinsella of course um, um, Lysander Spooner was another example. He was, he was terrible in the subject, so absolutely dreadful on the subject. Uh, by the way, one of the reasons I'm, I'm convinced that the, that the capitalists and the anarcho-capitalists and the liberal capitalists where I've always been incorrect on this, on this point and failing to see the communism of ideas is that they were all writers. <laughs> so the primary thing they did in their life was write. You know, so of course they believe in private property over their, their writings and ideas because that's what they did. They generated ideas, and so and they wrote about private property and thought, "Wow, private property should pertain to me, if nothing else." You know, uh, and the only thinker I can really name that had it consistently right is F. A. Hayek. Actually, it's very interesting. He wrote it, didn't write about it much, but he was he was exactly right that um, about 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 ideas in the realm of ideas um, uh, it was a, 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 a consistent opponent of, of both a patent and and trademark and copyright even mm. so um, but anyway let me just uh, move on now to describe what I'm talking about this mere anarchism which you'll pick up in, in the Shorty book so I, I've listed seven traits of, of what I'm calling mere anarchism. First, it's peaceful. You definitely get this sense from Chartier's book. He longs for a world of perfect peace and, and beauty. He understands that it cannot take place just by getting a bit of weaponry and, and guns and that sort of thing. But he's, he sees the possibility for a universal forms of peaceful human engagement. And he wants to see that realized he knows that it cannot be realized perfectly, even in his utopia, in which there's no state, of course. There is no in the utopia, in fact. Um, but he says we, that the absence of the state gives us the greatest chance for peace that we can possibly ever have. In the first instance, uh, by eliminating states, you eliminate war completely. So, And you eliminate uh, police abuse, you eliminate all forms, you know, massive forms, maybe most forms of violence in the world, uh, just through this one action. It doesn't mean it creates a perfect world, but it, it makes the world a lot more peaceful. And peace is a primary value. So mere anarchism upholds peace as an ideal. The, the peace is the mother of all beautiful things. I think that's a quotation from Mises. And, and uh, you know, isn't it strange, you look back, how um, the word peace became to be demonized by the American right. Oh, the peace movement. Disgusting, the peace movement. The peace sign, the hippies with their peace sign. Oh, peace, ha, ha, ha. You know, this is all throughout the 1960s and the 1970s. On the, on the right, the American political right, you know, ridiculing peace, you know, that there's some sort of left-wing, you know, an idiotic, dangerous, preposterous left-wing idea. You know, wow, right? Okay, uh, let's let's recapture peace as an idea. A uh, second thing is uh, it's uh, that's number one. Number two, non-dogmatic. Um, maybe it sounds strange to you that anarchism could be non-dogmatic, but it, but actually, uh, there's no such thing as dogmatic anarchism because the whole point of anarchism is to establish 
a world of freedom and creativity. Um, sorry, now I'm getting pings. I'm sure you just heard that. Um, freedom and creativity where there's no set end in sight, where there's always ongoing experimentation, and we don't necessarily know what it would look like. Uh, there are forms of, of anarcho-capitalism that imagine that, that, uh, that they've figured out all uh, ways that the world's going to work. Like, like the, uh, under anarcho, an, an, a perfect anarcho-capitalism, you'd have like a council of of, of judges that, that have perfectly discerned all the implications of the non-aggression principle and can apply it to every single situation in life. I find these people just, just un, unbearably annoying because they always want answers to everything. They'll come up to me at seminars, you know, and, 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 and say it in hangouts and interviews. How would, how would anarcho-capitalism deal with the following scenario? Um, my neighbor borrows my toaster, you know, and I and I agree to lend it to her for seven seven weeks, but the eighth week hasn't come. And you know, they'll give me the scenarios and want me to explain, like how anarcho capitalism would deal with that situation. And my answer is, uh, you know, always, well, I have no clue. I'm sure you figure something out that's in the interest of both parties to resolve this toaster dispute somehow, and maybe there will be a norm that emerges out of that because of a successful revolution, uh, resolution of that dispute, and that becomes, you know, kind of a, a, a prevailing default uh, situation for, for people uh, to use that rule insofar as it, it matters to them. But I have no, I, there's no reason for me to uh, predict the precise nature of how all laws in, a, in that society would work. So in that sense, it's non-dogmatic. It allows the social order to work out its own problems. It allows the system to run and to always move forward. Thirdly, um, mere anarchism is empirical. It takes account of the existing realities all around us. It doesn't imagine like a change in human nature. Uh, it doesn't imagine some far-flung world that's radically different from our own. It, it reflects constantly on our regular engagements in life. You know, how we get up in the mornings. We don't have a police uh, wake us up in the morning um, to get us to work. Um, we don't have to have the state to tell us who we're going to fall in love with. We don't need the government to, 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 to tell us to send uh, Christmas cards to our relatives or, re, or remember anniversaries or remember Mother's Day or something. I mean, it, it, or, or to start businesses, or for me to go down to the store and buy a box of pasta. I mean, 99% of the world's actions and activities take place within the realm of anarchism, which is to say they belong to the realm of human volition. And to observe that as an empirical reality, as an, as an Aristotelian boots on the ground, this is the way the world works, it, you know, kind of, kind of facts, um, is a particular, a particularly beautiful, and I would say compelling form of anarchism. I've got two minutes left. Okay, uh, the fourth point is that it's always realistic. Um, Chartier's form of anarchism does not uh, permit, uh, does not uh, require that you take take uh, LSD and uh, f fly into a dreamlike state to uh, 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 imagine um, colors that smell or whatever. I mean, it's just, it's completely realistic about the world. Again, there's an Aristotelianism that's at the heart of it. Uh, always dealing with reality uh, rather than fantasy. Uh, fifth, it's, it's practical. Uh, he's dealing with, and, uh, which is my form of anarchism. I, I said in an article recently that I have to be. I have to be, admit that my my own form of anarchism is is more practical than it is theoretical. You know, I, I see anarchism as providing a pr practical solutions to all of life's problems, and in a very close, sort of mundane way. Uh, it's not some far flung uh, uh, vision. It's it's a very practical day to day way that the world works. Um, sixth, and I'm sorry I'm burning through this so quickly, it's radical. It's radical because it departs very strongly from the way the world's been organized for the last 100 years, last 500 years, <coughs> as far as we know, for the last 5,000 years, where the prevailing human model has always been create a state which is the um, privileged 
uh, ruling class apparatus that uses aggressive violence against person and property in a, in a particular geographic reason to bring about a certain social priorities through, through violence. Um, and, uh, bring, and and allows unto itself a permission to operate according to a different law than the rest of society. That's what a state is. That's the prevailing idea that the world should work. So uh, the mere anarchism is truly and deeply radical in the sense that it imagines vaporizing this, what I consider to be a fallacy, and just letting the world uh, run. Um, uh, a more perfect version of itself. Uh, uh, a society, a, a world where we that we love, with with it, with the absence of all the things we hate, is the way I like to describe mere anarchism. Finally, and this is my seventh trait of what I'm calling mere anarchism. It's always hopeful. It's hopeful because it has confidence in the ability to people to solve their problems. And since people are smarter than governments, since entrepreneurs are brighter than bureaucrats. Since creative people left to their own devices and who are crowdsourcing knowledge are always going to come up with maybe not perfect solutions, but better solutions than you're ever going to generate out of legislators, um, bureaucracies, and crufty old rule books of, um, of, 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 of codes of states, um, we have reason to be always hopeful uh, about the future, that we're going to outsmart of those who rule us. Uh, so those are my seven traits of mere anarchism. It's peaceful, it's non-dogmatic, it's empirical, it's realistic, it's practical, radical, and hopeful. And I, I do think that this is the right kind of anarchism. And this is why I think this is such a good book. It corrects for the errors of anarcho-socialism, anarcho-communism, anarcho-utopianism, perfectionism, and even capitalism without ever naming them it just gives, gives a pure statement of, of, of what's beautiful and what's true. Okay, I've used way over my time now. Why do I always do this? I don't know. Um, okay, let me just quickly read through some of these. Uh, um, uh, some of these things. Okay, we've got a little debate uh, brewing here about intellectual property and physical objects. I'm just not going to go into it because it's too much and I can't do it. Um, I've seen a YouTube of someone accosting you in the hallway. So, oh God, yeah, geez, yeah, that that was a weird thing. Uh, I thought he was interviewing me. Instead, he just accosted me about about uh, non viability of, of anarchism. You know, it was a very interesting interview. What the what the guy did to me because he kept generating scenarios under which there are competing forms of law, and there's no solution to this, so they just decide to fight each other. I, I, I don't know. I'm always just really intrigued by these kinds of things. Um, you know, let's say I have a, a disagreement with my, 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 my next door neighbor about um, how, loud, how loud they hear dog barks, you know? Uh, so you've got already competing jurisdictions in that case. I've got in my own mind a jurisdiction in which a dog is not barking in an annoying way, in her mind. She's got a jurisdiction in which the dog has got their freedom to bark. Okay, so I go over there, um, and, I, and I confront her about it. I said, your, your dog's getting my nerves. Now, it's entirely possible that she takes out a kitchen knife and starts to stab me, and that I have to sort of um, uh, protect myself, take off my shoe and whack her on the head. But on the other hand, there's blood all over the floor, and neither of us have actually solved the problem. Um, her dog doesn't, still doesn't have the freedom to bark, and I don't have the freedom not to listen to her dog, you know? Why is that in the interest of either of us? Now, obviously, people fight in all times and all places. But gradually, I think what, 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 what happens over time is that people discover that we're all better off with peaceful solutions, even if they're not ideal. You know, you, you, figure, out, you figure out a way. Um, and humanity is capable of coming up with institutions that cause us to uh, behave better and engage each other in ever more mutually beneficial ways. I mean, that's, that's all. That, but this guy who had confronted me in the hallway and kept annoying me, he was positing the, impossib the impossibility of people to solve their own problems. So he wanted to give away, give all problem-solving responsibility to the state. Now, what's, to me, this is very interesting. It's like, I guess my, always my question is like, why do you think the state is smarter than people? I mean, what is it that's so brainy and brilliant 
about people once they inhabit public office and are paid through tax dollars, that's not possible um, in the in the regular social order. I mean, where where is the answer to this? I, I've never understood this. Why they think that there's some sort of magic, um, magical capacity, of brilliance associated with 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 governance? It's 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 very it's very uh, bizarre. Um, but anyway, every time I tried to explain this to him, he he interrupted me, and I finally just had to walk off. It was one of those situations where he thought he had somehow um, proven that I was an idiot. <laughs> I don't really know. That's an. I, I wish I had never. Give, I should have never given that interview. And actually, I should have walked off earlier. But I hung around a very long time because I'm I'm naive, and I always like to think that people are gonna are gonna come around. And I always have such hope for people. But this guy was just uh, insufferable. So. Well, I've reached the end of my time, and I've held you over longer than I should have. And if I do that, then you won't come back. I know the way these things work. Uh, I, I was always uh, inspired when I was a kid. Uh, I, 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 was, I was in a church youth group, and they would always take us to meetings where people would get inspired by the Lord. And, um, and the Spirit was moving among us, and so we had to stay much longer. And so we'd have, you know, an hour meeting would last two or three hours. And then the very next week came for the prayer meeting next time and everybody would reflect on that and go, I don't know. It says it's an hour, but I know what happened last week. It lasted three hours. There's no way I'm going back this week. So the thing would die. So ever since then, I always believed that even if the Spirit is moving, even if the Holy Spirit is touching your heart and you're being moved to, to change your, your, your life, uh, still, the meeting should end on time because <laughs> otherwise you will come back. So thank you so much for, for coming tonight. I've really enjoyed being with, with you. Um, I've enjoyed talking about the subject. You know, these meetings are very important for me personally because they allow me to kind of work out my own, my own thinking in, in real time, and, and I enjoy it very much. I always end up like better off after this hour than I began it, and partially because I'm inspired by your presence and by your appreciation for, for this event. Thank you so much. And I, listen, we've got a big week of seminars. I mean, we've got some amazing stuff happening. I think um, tomorrow night we've got uh, Lynn Ulbrich, and I'm sure you've been following the Ross Ulbrich stuff. Kind of she, I think she's going to be on with us. And the hour before that, I'm going to be talking to Naomi Brockwell about the trial uh, where she attended. Um, and this is an emotional subject for me. I can't stop writing about it. I can't stop thinking about it. So um, that goes on uh, Monday night. And then I think Tuesday night, there's some other, oh, uh, there's a big event with uh, some of the top players at BitPay. Uh, BitPay has been promoting it all day, so I'm, I'm coming to a big evening seminar with, with, with BitPay on, on Tuesday night. So we've got a lot, of th a lot of things going on this week. Thank you for being a member of Liberty.me. Always remember to recruit more people into our lovely community. All the best to you. Take care, my friends. Stay free. Uh, barriers that I could not overcome, and I wasn't able to publish it, actually. Um, uh, one of the things I asked for was a, a change in the name. I have to say that was my own judgment, that the name should, of the book should not be conscious of an anarchist. It should be something else. Uh, looking back, I was definitely wrong about that. Um, it's 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 actually uh, fairly interesting how this happens. Um, uh, one quick second. Um, it, it's one of my few times in my life. Um, one, hold on, just one second. I'm letting somebody know about where this seminar is. Okay. Um, it's one of the few times in my life when I actually had the opportunity to publish um, what I think might eventually emerge as a, as a kind of a seminal work, you know, the kind of book that maybe people will be reading in 20 years, you know, uh, 30 years, 50 years, you know, something like a, a modern classic, I, and, uh, and, and declined it. You know, which is, is kind of something of a disgrace to me, actually. Because, you know, you hear stories all the time like, uh, oh, you know, 70 publishers rejected Little House in, in the Boogie Woods when it was first submitted or, you know, whatever whatever the thing, whatever the apocryphal story is about. Oh, oh George Orwell submitted, you know, 1984 to, 
you know, 140 publishers before one picked that up, you know, that kind of thing. 25 books that I really love. And so it's kind of exciting for me. Um, this is actually my second time through the 25 books. Um, I forget now what number one. But I never mind it because the book is kind of a, it serves as a nice launching pad for a discussion of the topic. And increasingly that's what I'm doing, you know, not just ad adhering to the text, but using the text as a, as a basis for discussing some other big issue. And um, last week we talked about, I think John T, uh, John T. Flynn's book called, called um, As We Go Marching. And, and brown shirt fascism as a as a as an ideology, you know, and and how that's how it's different, I believe, from kind of left wing socialism. Even though they're both varieties of socialism, they're distinct varieties. I I I, I sincerely believe this that there is such a thing as right wing socialism and there's left wing socialism. And they're distinct uh, for particular reasons. And I think that this is an important claim because. Uh, you know, historians and historiographers and philosophers dispute this all the time, but um, I'm very much convinced of it. And I also argued last week that I thought right-wing uh, socialism was a much greater, right-wing fascism, I guess you could say, uh, is a much greater danger to American liberty and always has been than the sort of mythical idea of, 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 of uh, socialism and, and the Red Scare, which was never a legitimate threat to the United States at all. So, in terms of American liberty, or even liberty in the West generally, I mean, the Bolshevik Revolution spooked everybody. Hey, good evening, Liberty Meers, and others interested in the topic of anarchism. It's good to see you tonight. Just to adjust my tabs. Hello, 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 guest Pat. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope I hope my sound sounds good. I can see the chat window, which is very, very nice. So, which means I think that you'll be able to ask questions and I'll be able to answer them um, as the seminar goes along. So I would encourage you to ask me questions, you know, interrupt me anytime. Um, I don't want to call it seminar. I would say there should be other, some other word for this. I mean, seminar sounds dreadful. It's like, oh, some guy talking to you. Like, we haven't had that enough in life, right? I mean, from the very earliest age, we've been lectured to. So tedious. From the kindergarten all the way through graduate school, there's some guy in front of you um, yapping and telling you what to think. So I, I can't stand this idea of a seminar. Um, lecture doesn't sound right either. Discussion is good. Uh, but, um, but it's actually kind of difficult to discuss in this context. And mostly, too, I, uh, I talk too much. So... <laughs> so. I don't know. We need some of the, yeah. Maybe hangout is is actually the right the right word, right? I kind of like the idea of a, of a hangout. Um, I always enjoy Sunday evenings uh, going through the literature. You know, at the outset of this series, I picked Betty, um, but yeah, I was, I argued that for like a hundred years we've been um, we've been afraid of a myth essentially, we, even as the brown shirts have been gathering around us in, in every form. And the brown shirts don't have to be necessarily right wing. <laughs> There's left wing brown shirts, left wing right wing brown shirts, you know, um, which I would sort of consider uh, Obamacare to be a great example of that. <laughs> anyway, I talked about a lot of this last week and, and tried to take you back to World War II and the Times and John T. Flynn as a thinker and a writer and, and, and where he went with all this stuff. Now this week, I get to talk about. <laughs> It was one of the few brand new books that I have in the collection um, called Conscience of an Anarchist by Gary Chartier, uh, Chartier, Chartier or Chartier, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, historian of, of business philosopher, uh, ethicist in Southern California, I forget now which university he teaches at. But um, I, I had the opportunity to publish this book, actually, as I look back at it. Um, I was at the Mises Institute at the time, and he wrote the book and sent it to me. And I was trying to get it through the editorial process, and I became a little bit severe with it um, and uh, a little bit cautious about the text and, and critical at certain points uh, just, just because I was, I was assigned to doing a distinct sort of edit, I had a distinct editorial role. Um, and I, you know, eventually bumped into.
uh, neither. I mean, I'm just making this up, but you know, you hear stories like this, and your first thought is, is uh, "Wow, the pub publishers are really incredibly stupid." Well, you know, so I'm just going to admit to you that I was one of those people that actually re rejected a, a classic. <laughs> so that itself is sort of part of the story. I mean, I I held on to it for months. I was trying to solicit really good reviews of the book, and I got some. And uh, but I, I just eventually I ran into uh, 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 one one simple barrier, you know, and and so I had to I had to turn it down. He was actually extremely gracious about it. Then it ended up being published by a very small and I think nearly defunct uh, publisher in California. Uh, a publishing a small publishing house run by Jim Perrin and fortunately uh, Gary with with extraordinary foresight um, insisted that the book be published you know in the Commons meaning that the publisher did not have exclusive rights to it um, if you're in a position to publish a book I mean please consider this option because if it weren't for for the author having insisted upon putting this in the commons, this book would have absolutely died the death. You would not be reading it now. And um, nobody would have been able to read this book for another